Welcome to today's roundtable webinar brought to you by Cockroach Labs, DataVail, and Portworks by Pure Storage. I'm Stephen Fegg, Director of Database Trends and Applications and Unisphere Research. I will be your host for today's broadcast. Our presentation today is titled Running Databases on Kubernetes, Considerations, and Best Practices. Before we begin, I want to explain how you can be a part of this broadcast. There will be a question and answer session. If you have a question during the presentation, just type it into the question box provided and click on the submit button. We're going to try to get to as many questions as possible, but if your question has not been selected during the show, you will receive an email response. Plus, if you would like a copy of the presentation, you can download a PDF from the handouts tab on the console once this event is archived on dbta.com. And just for participating in today's event, you could win a $100 Amazon gift card. Now, to introduce our speakers for today, we have Jim Walker, VP of Product Marketing at Cockroach Labs, Charlotte King, MongoDB Practice Lead at DataVail, and Rajiv Sacker, Director of Product Marketing at Portworks by Pure Storage. Now I'm going to pass the event over to Jim. Hi, everybody. How are you? Um, I hope you can see what I'm doing. It seems my internet just wanted to freak out right before I started this. So um, I may ask Stephen if you could push slides to the first one. I, I can't see what I'm doing. So I'm on slide six. Sorry. Um, I don't know why. But these things always happen like this, right, everybody? So, hey, um, no worries. Jim. What's, that? What's that, Stephen? I, I said no worries. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so my name is Jim Walker. I am, uh, like, like Stephen said, I'm uh, VP of Product Marketing at Cockroach Labs. Um, I, you know, I've been in the Kubernetes space for really quite some time. Um, you know, I kind of was early days at KubeCon. I kind of helped start that. And I moved into a company called CoreOS. And CoreOS was kind of one of these first companies really driving, you know, this, this kind of more kind of broad, you know, enterprise adoption of, of what Kubernetes is going to be. And, and I think the team there did a great job of, you know, really kind of starting to build out, like, what, what Kubernetes meant for everybody. You know, while I was there, though, we wanted to show applications that would run on top of Kubernetes. And, you know, there weren't a whole lot back then. And definitely nothing really stateful, a lot of stateless applications, right? And so, um, you know, our CEO at the time, guy by the name of Alex Colby, he introduced me to somebody named Spencer Kimball. Spencer is the founder of Cockroach Labs. And, and Spencer came on, and we had a presentation, and... What Spencer showed was a database that was running natively on Kubernetes, and this is about four or five years ago, um, without an operator, without any special configuration, just simply building on top of, well, at that point it was daemon sets, um, but simply on top of staple sets, a, a database that was purely written and created in the same exact distributed principles as Kubernetes. Um, and, and I kind of, I, my eyes opened up. I said, wow, that's cool. Um, I didn't really have to do anything to actually just make this thing work, right? Um, and, you know, look at, I was, we were, we were killing pods that had a database instance, and we were bringing them back, and the database saw no impact, right? And so, you know, these same concepts that we think about in Kubernetes are the same concepts that are applied really in, um, in, in CockroachDB. And I want to talk a little bit about those uh, here on, on this session. So I hope this is helpful. Um, so let's go to the next slide, Stephen, slide seven. Um, so... You know, a lot's happened over the past couple of years, but actually nothing's happened when we start to think about our common goals, right? Like, I think everybody in the world is trying to deploy to production much quicker. I think that's what we think about when we think about Kubernetes. One of the things that why it came about, right? Um, we all want to lower operational costs. We all want to increase the developer productivity. And, and ultimately, this really kind of leads to a better customer experience. And I think, you know, these are the goals of pretty much every single organization I've, I've ever been involved with, right? I think it's like, you know, I think back when I was a developer, we were worried about, about, about the same things, right? And so when I look at this, it's kind of like, well, you know, what, what are we trying to accomplish here and what's getting in the way? And, and often, especially in the Kubernetes community, we start thinking about, oh man, the database is really difficult. We end up running the database kind of alongside Kubernetes or, you know, we, we end up running it kind of like not on it, but, you know, kind of this, this kludgy kind of environment. And so, ultimately, everything is kind of optimized for the cloud. So, the next slide is slide eight, Stephen. Um, you know, what we've seen is kind of an emerging stack of technologies come about that are helping us actually reach these goals. 
Um, and, and if you think about this, these are the threaded languages. You know, we use CI, CD to get things. We provision uh, cloud, you know, tech with Terraform and whatnot. But, but really, there's this, this evolution of distributed application infrastructure that is allowing us to finally really address these goals. Next slide, thank you. Um, so if you, if you start to fill in kind of the tech that, the technology stack that, that we see emerging in, in a lot of leading organizations, you know, they're coding in Go. Of course, they're using GitHub and GitLab. They're using Git, right? They're using Jenkins and Terraform. They're deploying on public cloud providers, um, you know, a whole world of different types of instances there and different services. And then there's this orchestration layer uh, called Kubernetes that's actually managing a whole lot of these things in production. It's the data layer that I see gets really interesting. And when I think about the cloud, we think about distributed systems, I think about two sides of data as well. There's operational data and there's analytical data. Um, I think we have kind of dismissed the importance of the relational data model over the past, you know, five years or so, but it's actually pretty important. In fact, you know, most applications I know of actually still, still run on that stuff, right? So, um, we're, so we're seeing this kind of this, this, this emerging stack that's allowing us to get, you know, to accomplish these goals, right? And so when I think about that, I always think about the database. So, so the next slide, Stephen, thank you. Um, you know, Cockroach DB really came about as kind of an answer to, you know, years of technological advancement. You know, I, I, look, I'm a software developer in, in, you know, originally, and for me, you know, I, I, I love to see how every year I think things advance. Um, you know, we've had, you know, relational databases for 30, 40 years. They're great. They're reliable. They're, like, I get really consistent, trusted data. Um, I'm familiar with them. I like data models. I like referential integrity. Um, I like joins, right? I, I think like the, the normalization of data and the calculus that we put around the data model is actually really important. You know, I never really got used to the document model and NoSQL databases. I find it a little bit complex to, to navigate. I find it complex to change. Um, but there's some really great things about NoSQL databases in that they're scalable, they're resilient, you know, they're, they're, they're somewhat flexible, right? But, but when you start to combine these things with the cloud native world of being distributed, being orchestrated, you know, this is this modern approach, you know, you, you kind of take all these things together, you take the best of the relational world, and you take this kind of ease of scale and ease of resilience, you combine these things together, and that's really ultimately the, the, the resultant outcome of, of, you know, if that's CockroachDB ultimately. Um, you know, the, the, the inception of CockroachDB actually is a spawn of something that Google created. Um, you know, Google created uh, Google Cloud Spanner. You may know the product now. Um, and they developed that internally. They published the white paper, oh gosh, about maybe, maybe eight years ago, nine years ago, something like that. You know, the founders of this company, Peter Spencer and Ben, you know, they were working at Google. They actually, I think Peter and, and Spencer built uh, the Google Colossus, which is the backend file system. So, you know, real deep kind of, you know, uh, experience at Google. I think they were like in the like number 300 employees, right? Um, and so they took their learnings there, and, and when they left, they were frustrated. They wanted a database that acted like Spanner. And so they said, well, why don't we just build this thing? I mean, the paper's out there, and that's really what they did. So CockroachDB is really kind of born of, of Spanner, just as Kubernetes is, is kind of born of Borg. Borg is kind of the back-end, you know, orchestration system that runs at Google. And I think if you look at this stack, you look, kind of look what's going on. It is kind of Google infrastructure for everyone else, right? I think that's what's because, you know, it's kind of the, the fun play on words that I think people are looking at as, as we kind of venture into this new world, right? So, um, so Cockroach CD guarantees transactions, it's inherent, resilient, and scale. This is they're literally wire compatible with Postgres, so it's familiar, and then it's fully elastic. This is truly like a, a, a distributed system. You know, written with all the same kind of, uh, you know, the, the same kind of uh, things as, as distributed systems that we see today. So, um, okay, so let me see if I, I my internet is back, Stephen, but I'm going to still ask you to go to the next slide, okay? So I think it's slide 11, buddy. Thank you. Yep, we're so, on slide uh, 11 now. Great, thank you, man. Um, so Cockroach CV was really, like I said, architect for the cloud, but this is just a relational database. This is just familiar uh, SQL. So when you code against it, all your developers, it's wire compatible with Postgres, so it just looks like the same SQL syntax that we've been using for years and years and years, which I think is actually a really important place to start because, again, the, the, the relational data model is actually pretty important. Um, you know, can you do online schema changes? Do you have referential integrity? These sort of things, kind of things that you don't see in kind of a document database like a Mongo or that sort of thing, right? So I think in, in more complex or kind of mission-critical systems, 
you know, developers do want to use these kind of relational models, right? So a very big difference there, right? Um, and this isn't about, you know, scaling just reads. So if you go to the next slide, Stephen. Um, when, when we scale Cockroach DB, ultimately what it is, is a, it's just a system that knows. This is an instance of Cockroach, which basically is the full binary running on in a, a container on a pod. And as the pod goes down, the, they'll come back up. And so all I simply do is just go into Kubernetes and, and hit STD and actually scale the database by adding more pods that have Cockroach running it. And I have instantly scaled the database. Now, Cockroach DB in the background is actually spreading the data around and spreading all the rights. Any node in Cockroach can serve as a write. So you're not just scaling the volume, you're also scaling the transactional volume and the number of endpoints that can actually handle a transaction, which is actually pretty cool. Now, underneath the covers, when you write data to Cockroach, it's actually written in triplicate. So I have three copies of the data. So if I lose one, I'm still going to have two copies. Um, there's, a, there's a concept in distributed systems called RAS, and we implement that, right? So we're going to get quorum writes when we write data to the database. So the next slide, um, Stephen. So when, when, we, when we actually write to the database, you know, we're writing, in, say, a single region, um, we can actually deploy Cockroach, and it's typically done this way in multiple different regions, so I can survive the failure of an entire region. I'll come back to that. But, but Cockroach can actually scale across clusters. I could have three Kubernetes clusters, each of them with, you know, different instances of, of Cockroach database running in pods, and I don't have to have a single control plane for all the clusters, but I have kind of a single data plane um, where I'm scaling across multiple different clusters, right? And so if I think about that on slide nine, I can start to federate data instead of federating Kubernetes clusters. And we've done this countless times. You know, people ask us all the time, okay, what's the trick here? How do you, how do you, deal, how do, you do this? I mean, the, the networking alone will kill you. There's lots of different tools out, well, not lots. I mean, there's a couple of different tools. If you, if you talk to the, the folks, uh, you know, um, the Scupper project is actually helping uh, with, with cross-cluster networking configuration. Um, and then the, the Cilium team, um, you know, as open source product EPF that, that actually allows you to start to do all of this, this networking capability as well. But what we're looking at is one single logical database where I can ask any one of the nodes for the data and no matter where it lives across all three of these clusters, I now have access to that. Now that's pretty cool, but where I think it even gets cooler, right, and, and really aligned with, with what we're thinking about in Kubernetes is we can actually start to run things across multiple different clouds, which is, which is um, uh, the next slide, which is 15. Thank you, Stephen. I think I lost, I think I, I forgot to tell you before, but of course this is my day today, buddy. Um, so we can actually run multiple different Kubernetes clusters across multiple different cloud providers and now have one single logical database across all of those. Um, we've got a customer over in the UK, Forum 3, that's doing this exact configuration today because they want to survive the failure of an entire cluster, an entire cloud provider. Um, and so this is really kind of that hybrid and multi-cloud use case. You know, lots of, lots of people out there looking at OpenShift to do this from Red Hat. Uh, you know, we partner really extensively with them, and we're doing this in lots of different places. So the, ne the next slide, Stephen, you know, ultimately when it comes down to this, it, this is all about kind of, you know, this, this scaling, you know, this easy scale of the database for both, you know, storage and, and transactions. You scale down, by the way, really easily, too. Um, it just automates all that. But it's also about survival. How do I survive the, the failure of a, a, a pod or an entire rack or an entire AZ or region or an entire cluster? Um, so really Cockroach was designed to do that. And at the table level, you can start to actually move data around and, and, and pin it to locations based on what you want to do from a survival point of view. Maybe I have one copy of the data in each one of these three clusters, right? And that way, if I lose one cluster, I still have two copies. I can still survive that. Or maybe, if you go to the next slide, I want to speed access to this data, which is slide 17, right? Um, right now, uh, I have three clusters. I have one in US West, US East, and, and, and one in EMEA. This is one single logical database. And here I have a user out in LA asking for some data from one of the nodes. That node knows how to find the data over in somewhere else, say the, the, the lead record, the, the leaseholder, or the RAF leader is located in the EMEA. So I want to insert this Kimball record in the customer. Well, I've written the data in triplicate, these three records, right? This is a range of what, what we call it. And it's able to go get that and insert that record. Now, if you go to the next slide, Stephen, 
Well, we do that because, well, we want the, 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 the RAF leader or the leaseholder actually located close to the user. So we already have a user called Kimball, and he's simply accessing that data over in, in EMEA. And so now we're doing this kind of cross-cluster, cross-regional kind of thing going on here, right? So um, pretty powerful, and one of the reasons why people use this, okay? All right, so um, the next slide, Stephen, I'm going to wrap this up pretty quickly here. Um, so, so what I'm describing is a database that kind of scales easily and is naturally resilient. So just the way that you scale Kubernetes by adding more pods, you can scale compute, right? Like, or you can scale, you know, whatever service you use. The same exact principles apply here. The same thing about, you know, having the, having the node fail and you just spin it right back up and it, it reconnects and, and you're back in, the, in, 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 in business, right? Um, that, that natural resilience of Kubernetes is something else, right? And, and so ultimately, look at the, this database was designed exactly for Kubernetes. In fact, you know, very early days, people said, do you have an operator? And, and we actually used to just say no, because ultimately, we didn't really need an operator because, you know, day, day one stuff, we didn't really have to care about that because we were so well aligned with Kubernetes, right? Um, but we actually do have an operator. We do day two operations like helping you with rolling upgrades or these sort of things, right? So whereas kind of a legacy database needs these operators to make it actually function, to attach storage and all these different types, we just naturally attach to whatever storage you're used to using in pods. And it, it's pretty natural experience. There's no kind of crazy special configurations or lots of concerns. And, and we walk people through that uh, pretty easily. It's, we just can, you know, can pawn on top of the storage class. So this is really one of the most easiest ways of getting started with, with the database uh, naturally built for Kubernetes. This isn't single region. This isn't you know, automatic sharding. No, this is truly a distributed system. I think that's the difference of, uh, um, of Cockroach and really kind of some of the other stuff that's out there today. So um, I'm happy to take questions along the way. I'm going to refresh my browser to make sure I can actually see all this stuff. But Stephen, I want to thank you for uh, for pushing my slides forward today. I, I ended on fourteen, and I'm going to or nineteen, and I'm going to skip twenty. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, buddy. All right. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker today. We have Charles King, MongoDB Practice Lead at DataVail. Hi, I'm I'm Charles King. I'm the Practice Lead for Mongo and NoSQL at DataVail, and um, let me. There we go. So DataVail, we, we started off as basically a database company, whereas we, we support customers with their various database implementations from Oracle, MySQL, Postgres. And then we also now do um, AppDev, um, data integr integration and analytics. So I've been doing this since 15 plus years. I've been doing this since the, the, the 90s. So, um, and I'm now working with Kubernetes with Mongo deployments primarily, but we also do that with uh, other S relational databases as well. So I'm going to just, in case anybody on here doesn't know, I'm just going to give a quick overview of Kubernetes and the considerations that people um, need to take for using it. Um, what's the function of your database is a question you need to ask. And then what kind of problems do we see and then what are the kind of workarounds? And then obviously my area of expertise is MongoDB, so I'll talk about that specifically. Um, so why do people want to use Kubernetes that we see? Um, they don't want to use a single server deployment. They want to have inter-host communication of containers. Um, you know, they want to have the deploying and maintenance of software at scale. They want auto healing. They want logging and monitoring. And they want better manageability through modularity. And then, and then what do you get with Kubernetes? You get the building blocks to deploy, maintain, and scale for edi editing and updating a running application. You can schedule things for your app as needed. You get monitoring and logging and role-based access. So some of the considerations that we um, like to ask about using K Kubernetes is what is your Kubernetes pod going to be how is Kubernetes going to be configured to treat the pods of your data? So are you going to have failover elections, replication, sharding, cluster management? Um, what kind of tools are you going to be using for handling failover and switchover, coordinated node operation, what kind of routing, load balancing, connection pooling? All of these are things you need to think about before architecting using Kubernetes with databases. 
So what is the function of your database that you're going to be implementing? Are you going to be using it for transient data? Are you going to be using it as a caching layer, a local store, or if, are you going to be using it as like a master database? Um, and this I'm talking about in your pods that you're going to orchestrate with Kubernetes. So what are the kind of problems we see with regards to databases? Um, we get possible data loss with asynchronous replication. Um, there's memory constraints, um, storage constraints, and resilience. Um, we recently had a customer that thought, oh, I can just go get this, this image with a uh, MongoDB from from you know cloud store you know like the AWS store, and they implemented it, and then they found that it was kept crashing as soon as their data size got to a certain size, so they kept on having to prune the data, and that was because of how it was configured, and the memory wall as well as the storage wall. Um, so what are the workarounds for these kinds of problems that we see? So for asynchronous replication, you need to either distribute to a master database, managed or on-premise. Um, you can use Kubernetes implementations that are always secondary and then, ha again, have a primary or, you know, multi-multi master replication. You could think of it that way. Um, in your app, do you rely on the containerized data store as golden or are you going to have um, the, the data stored elsewhere? So, and then we also come into memory constraints. The, prop, the proper sizing of your containers and your architecture needs to be done uh, for, for what you expect to use. You need to limit the local data size and reduce the local indexes, um, and also prob properly configure both Kubernetes and the database for the container, not the host, hosting server. Um, a lot of um, different databases have different problems with this. Um, some will you say, you know, a certain allocated amount of memory from that is a, it finds on the host, and the container configuration versus the host configuration are vastly different. Um, for storage constraints, if you want to not have that issue, you need to minimize your use of local containerized storage and utilize mount points external to the container. You could log elsewhere, and you could also just uh, use local data trimming. And those are their different techniques that we could talk about for all of those. Um, for our example, since this is my area of, of most expertise, um, is MongoDB. So a couple of things to think about if you were going to use something like MongoDB um, and other things, there is the 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 software company that manufactures these databases, you know, like Oracle, MongoDB, um, they will have recommendations. So for MongoDB, um, they don't provide you with any web containers or, or images for MongoDB. And they just want you to work with Atlas or Enterprise. So you can um, get pre-wrapped containers for MongoDB to work well for transient data and caching layers and small data sets, including local data sets. Um, one of the things you need to also think about is Wired Tiger. It is the storage engine for MongoDB that's the default now, and it automatically allocates 50% of the total memory to Wired Tiger cache. Um, and that's of the total memory of the host. So um, the data size, it, it will grow to fill the containers, and that includes indexes. Um, you and you can't use the Kubernetes operator to deploy MongoDB resources to Atlas, which is um, might be something that people were thinking about. Um, Atlas is, of course, the RDF type of managed database for MongoDB. Um, MongoDB also wants you to use Atlas, or as I said, Atlas or Enterprise external with Kubernetes, so there's no official image. But you can find good solid images available in the community. Um, some of the to-dos for a standalone installation, if you do want to do that, you need to install the Kubernetes operator. Um, you need to create a project using your config map. Um, you, you do need to create the credentials using the operator and then store the MongoDB security credentials securely with the secrets. Um, you store the uh, 
configurations, all of the configurations you need with the config maps, and you use deployments for high availability. The persistent data can be persisted using volume claims, and you want to make sure you set up regular backups using Kubernetes cron jobs. Um, one of the things from the Docker community um, images that you can see, um, you want to make sure that you set the values of your root username and password, or it will be passwordless, which is poor security practices. Um, and you can use the cube control to create a Kubernetes secret or use a secret manifest. You need to create a MongoDB config file and store it as a config map item. That way it will pick up your settings. And when you do so, you need to set your max index memory usage for megabytes and your max log size for kilobytes and your op log size. And again, like we talked about, your wire tiger cache size. Um, one of the reasons we have to do this is because it will eat it all up. So if you set these things in your config file and then you, you use your, um, you map it and then it will pick it up when it starts and then you can have your data stored elsewhere. If you use mount the Mongo config file to your Mongo pod as a volume. So if you want ephemeral or persistent storage, you know, if it's ephemeral, just store it locally in your pod. But um, if you want persistent storage, you can, um, you can make your uh, mount your storage as a, a volume claim persistent volume claim and mount it to your deployment. Um, for ephemeral data, obviously you don't need to do that. You may want to do that for other parts of the data. So there's all those kinds of choices. Um, so best practices for your MongoDB services is you don't want to ex expose your pod as a service. You want to keep the service internal. And there's a couple of different ways you can do that. Um, oops, wrong button. Um, you can, uh, let me go back, sorry. You can uh, register the service or you can access it in other ways, but um, you, you wanna keep it as secure as possible even in, in your pod implementations. Um, so for backups, we like to use the, the Kubernetes cron job and then you can run the containerized image for the MongoDB, and then you mount the volume that's being used by the MongoDB instance, and then you can ex execute a Mongo dump. Um, and then we save the dump to our storage buckets for recovery if we need that sometime in the future. So for administration, um, best practices is to add a path port forward to your MongoDB service so you can have a proxy connection and use a Mongo shell to connect to it. Alternately, um, you know, very few people should be able to do this. You can use the pod name and you can shell into the pod and interact with MongoDB that way. But um, we like to implement, um, you know, the least privileged access. So that one is something that we would have only like, you know, one admin account that can do that for an emergency. <coughs> so, what I just wanted to say here is that, you know, you can use your databases with Kubernetes. It can be done. There are a lot of do's and don'ts, depending if you're going to go with something um, that's structured like MySQL or Postgres, or if you want NoSQL, um, there are some very, very specific things you wanted to keep in mind for each RDMS or database that are very particular for it. And um, you wanna make sure you research it properly and you know the pros and cons and the do's and don'ts. Um, but if you, you know, with the correct configuration and help from some, from experts and, you know, like people like me, um, your organization can really benefit from using Kubernetes in, in your implementation. And thank you very much. <laughs> and back to you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Charlest. Okay, at this point, I'd like to introduce our final speaker for today. We have Rajiv Thakkar, Director of Product Marketing at Portworks by Pure Storage. Thank you, Stephen. And, uh, you know, really 
happy and excited to be here to represent Portworks by Pure Storage. Uh, folks, what I'll do is, you know, obviously following, you know, Jim and Charles Esther's, you know, talks uh, and, and representing their point of views, I'll sort of come in with a uh, different perspective here. Uh, you know, everyone's benefiting from, you know, the scale and, and, you know, the efficiency for developers through Kubernetes and, you know, the innovations that, you know, these modern data services provides. Uh, what I'll do is I'll talk about a little bit about what we're hearing from customers, uh, what we announced recently with Portworks Data Services, uh, and sort of take it from there, okay? Uh, so, you know, with respect to, uh, you know, what's going on in the market, you know, of course, we announced uh, Portworks Data Services, but before I talk about that, let me tell you, you know, what developers really want, right? Uh, they want access to, you know, storage, they want access to infrastructure, right? But but that's not, you know, what they get up thinking. What they really want is, you know, how can they send data to Elasticsearch for indexing, you know, or, or use, you know, uh, Kafka for uh, streaming. Uh, they literally want uh, access to these data services and that's what we've discovered. And, and um, let me sort of share what I mean by that uh, in the next slide real quick. So, all of the apps that you know, Jim talked about, Charles Lester talked about, right? Uh, MongoDB, Cockroach Labs, and all the other apps that you're seeing here. These are modern data services, uh, you know, that developers are building, uh, you know, for organizations to change their customer experiences, right? Do AI ML based uh, inferencing or learning, or you know, even build uh, the codes behind, you know, uh, powering autonomous uh, driving vehicles, right? Uh, or uh, streaming events uh, across the world to send your messages to your customers or, you know, really innovate products or, or get closer to customers online. And these are some of the problems that Kubernetes platforms have opened up. And uh, these modern data services that you see here are something that are driving this innovation in all of the organizations. And, you know, enterprises, uh, you know, continue to be challenged, uh, A, in like quickly adopting these and, and obviously like, you know, taking advantage of the scale and, and the benefits and the innovation that these data services uh, unlock to run modern applications. Uh, and the patterns that we're seeing uh, that, uh, you know, surround the deployment of these data protection, security, uh, continue to be uh, some that all vendors are trying to, uh, you know, address. And uh, let me talk about uh, sort of our point of view here. Uh, and and share some customer research that uh, tells us that running these stateful apps on Kubernetes uh, actually has a massive uh, business impact, right? And what that means is that, you know, 55% uh, uh, or more of the customers we surveyed, um, you know, uh, representing pure storage was uh, of the opinion that, um, you know, to scale their applications faster uh, they needed their developers to be more efficient, right? And so they could do, you know, uh, more app development versus, you know, operations and, you know, worrying about, uh, you know, infrastructure provisioning or, uh, you know, deploying these uh, into day one or, you know, day zero. Uh, so uh, that is like the biggest challenge that keeps, uh, you know, organizations worried. Um, obviously, like uh, another 54% agree that, you know, Kubernetes allows them to, you know, develop applications uh, more quickly, right? Because of its um, nature and the fact that it's stateful. 50% um, agree it allows them to increase security by leveraging all of the automation that's built underneath, right? And then um, on top of that, uh, over a third actually see a reduction in costs with Kubernetes in part due to, uh, you know, the operational uh, efficiencies that we just talked about. Now, um, with that kind of impact, everyone must be, uh, you know, running all of their services on Kubernetes, right? Well, not necessarily, right? We're actually seeing uh, that uh, managing these stateful apps on Kubernetes in production is actually very difficult. Customers, uh, you know, have the same set of requirements that they had with, you know, um, enterprise apps uh, of the past decade, right? How do I back up and restore these things? How do I provide data mobility, right? How do I do capacity management, you know, high availability? Um, you know, uh, Jim talked about, uh, you know, the ability to 
uh, be multi-cloud ready, right? Move from one public cloud to the other, uh, doing encryption, uh, disaster recovery, right? These are the uh, requirements that surround these stateful acts and doing them on Kubernetes is, is certainly challenging. Uh, while there are a lot of benefits, uh, this is definitely a hard problem to solve. And so um, with that, let me switch the topic a little bit to you know, what Portworx is. Uh, we've been recognized as the gold standard in Kubernetes storage, right? And so like whether it's cloud native storage uh, or uh, enterprise Kubernetes storage, you know, GigaOM has recognized as the number one leader in this space. And so we have conquered these challenges, you know, for Kubernetes deployments as a Kubernetes storage platform. And, and it's great to be part of this journey. Uh, we're uh, by far, uh, you know, with the customers that you see here and some others that you don't, uh, and our partnerships with, you know, uh, industry, uh, you know, leaders in the cloud space uh, were clearly the most widely used Kubernetes data services platform by enterprises, by the new age SaaS companies, and the companies that are born in the cloud, right? And uh, that's who we really are. So what we would like to talk to you about today is how do you solve these data problems, you know, without, you know, actually uh, worrying about, uh, you know, all of these. Uh, and, and the first step in that direction is, well, how do you cloudify your infrastructure? Well, if you have infrastructure uh, on-premise or in the cloud, how do you, uh, you know, bring the cloud operating model to your compute network storage so they can be available in a self-service manner through APIs and be accessible to all your developers because of you know all of the containerized apps that you know Portworx's Kubernetes platform unlocks. So that is like the first best practice that I would recommend. And that's our point of view on on sort of you know what uh, folks should be doing while deploying databases um, on Kubernetes. The second piece is providing automation, right? So to do things like uh, availability, secure access, uh, providing that data management uh, platform to really, you know, uh, give security, backup, capacity maintenance, ensure there's compliance, all kinds of compliance levels. Uh, and, you know, also the ability to do disaster recovery and migration uh, for your uh, Kubernetes workloads. That is something that we highly recommend uh, when you deploy databases on Kubernetes. And then, you know, third, um, and certainly not the least, is how do you accelerate the adoption of data services? We're not just talking about providing data services to developers. We're actually talking about making sure that all of the infrastructure underneath is fully provisioned, their life cycle is fully managed, there is one place to consume these data services. And, you know, essentially that is the vision um, that we just announced uh, last week. Um, you know, and uh, Pure Storage was extremely uh, excited to talk about Portworx Data Services, which is, you know, an industry first database as a service platform for Kubernetes. It offers the broadest range of data services, you know, that can run on any infrastructure, really. And, and we're seeing a lot of interest from folks in getting access uh, to this platform. And that is essentially our recommendation in terms of, you know, if your organization is either uh, early or ahead in uh, deploying databases on Kubernetes, uh, we highly encourage you to uh, look at Portworx data services because what it does is it opens up, you know, this database as a service platform on any Kubernetes infrastructure, you know, powered by Portworx Enterprise, you can get all of the, you know, cloud native storage and, you know, enterprise uh, Kubernetes uh, storage to, you know, make sure that you offer, uh, you know, infrastructure to uh, developers that, you know, that can truly run an enterprise grade uh, Kubernetes application in production, uh, but also really consume these data services at the top through one click deployment uh, to curated templates for, uh, you know, any sizes of your databases across your organization. Uh, you could also like do scheduled backup policies uh, to really, you know, perform uh, data replication and uh, 
uh, data migration. And then how do you make sure that your modern data services are application aware? You know, they're API driven and, and you, know, you can actually use this uh, simpler user interface to, you know, consume, deploy, and, and manage and scale uh, these data services for your organization. That is the promise of uh, Portworks data services. And so um, that's what I would uh, leave you guys with. And with the, you know, power of Portworks data services, you not only unlock, uh, as I said earlier, the broadest range of data services, um, you know, with all of these enterprise grade production ready capabilities, uh, but really you can offer uh, these databases uh, on a managed infrastructure with um, you know, a single point of consumption, single point to get support for all of these uh, you know, through one user interface. Uh, that's essentially uh, uh, what we're uh, recommending as a best practice for deploying databases on Kubernetes. So uh, with that, I'll uh, say that if you haven't looked at Portworx data services, we do have the option for you to sign up and be part of the earliest program. And we're uh, pretty excited uh, to actually partner with uh, all of uh, the database uh, providers uh, you know, in the ecosystem and uh, deliver that uh, you know, sort of one-stop experience and a unified control pane um, for your organization so you can deliver data services to your developers and pave the way for innovation. With that, uh, I'll hand it back to Steven. Thank you very much, uh, Rajiv. At this point in time, we are going to dive into questions from our attendees today. And uh, Jim, the first questions are for you. Uh, we have a question, why is it named Cockroach? And what does wire compatible mean? So what was the first half of it? Why the name Cockroach? Yes. Yeah, well, we get that one a lot. Um, I got to tell you, my, the founders of this company have a little bit of a dark humor, uh, I guess you'd say. Um, actually, Peter Mattis and, and, and Spencer Kimball, who started this company, they were roommates in college uh, back in the, oh gosh, the early 90s there at Berkeley. They were computer science uh, undergrads. And they wrote a little program called The Gimp. And if you remember Pulp Fiction, there was a character called Gimp. And that's what they named it after. So that was their first product name. So I guess, you know, when they were building a database, and GIMP is an, it's one of the most widely used open source tools ever. It's a photo manipulation tool. If people aren't familiar with it. It's still available. Uh, and when they were starting the database, well, they thought about, wow, what is the database I can't kill? Uh, that's a cockroach. You know, living in New York, these guys, that's where they come up with. So it's a little bit of dark humor, Stephen, but uh, it works because it's actually pretty descriptive of, of this database. You just can't kill it. So it's pretty cool. Now, wire compatible means basically, there's two things about being compatible with something, right? There's the language, like so, you know, the 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 the, the drivers, the tools, the ORMs, these kind of things. I mean, we kind of have specialized ORMs, um, you know, that that you would use with Postgres are going to work with Cockroach database. Um, and then there's the syntax, the exact, you know, the select star where the DML, the DDL, like the the language that you actually use. I mean, we have a fair amount of coverage on that side. But really wire compatible means basically, you know, you could use the same tools that you're gonna use with, with say a Postgres. In fact, just last week, I, I spun up an instance of uh, Cockroach DB serverless and I and I used uh, one of these low code platforms called Retool. And I just used the Postgres uh, connection tool and it connected right to Cockroach and no problem. So it just kind of looks and feels like Postgres, but better is, is kind of the way that we, we look at that. And that, that wire compatibility allows us to do that. Understood. Thanks, Jim. Charles, our next question is for you. Uh, the question is, I heard precisely that Oracle supports 21C Kubernetes, but I want to understand if this is a good practice. I mean, force database deployments, even though the vendors disagree. Well, what, um, what we, this, sorry. From our experience, there are ways that you can make things work regardless of database and their recommendations. However, it gets to a point where there will be some kind of feature or expectation you have that will not work and will not be part of your You need to be carefully. Are you comfortable losing, you know, support? Because so for, if you have Oracle, you have Oracle support. Um, because if you're doing something they don't recommend, they won't help. Um, and are there some features you're willing to lose? 
So that's where you get into, and it doesn't matter which database you're using, you will hit that wall. Understood. Thanks, Charles. Rajiv, our next question is for you. With Portworks, where would the data live? Thanks, Steve. And um, I'm so glad you asked this question. Um, as I said in my presentation, we, we frankly don't care where the data lives. We, in fact, don't want your developers to be worried about infrastructure provisioning, right? If they're using EKS clusters, the data can be in EBS, right? If they're uh, using some of their on-prem infrastructure, the data can live there. Uh, we're less concerned about, you know, where the data uh, lives, and, and really they don't even need to buy a separate array to host this. This is a, you know, uh, purely cloud-like experience that is ready to go simply to deliver data services to your developers so they don't have to worry about infrastructure provisioning. That is what uh, Portworks take care, takes care of at the back end, and we're, we're agnostic. Got it. Thanks, Rajiv. Jim, we're circling back to you. I'll apologize in, in advance if you've already covered this, but the question is, do you have a Kubernetes operator for CockroachDB? So, yes, we absolutely do. I, I did talk, touch on that a little bit. I mean, you know, you, you know, funny operators have been around for a while. In fact, I was kind of, I helped kind of name them operators, honestly. Brandon Phillips, Rob Zimsky from Red Hat, Brandon Phillips, the founder of, of, uh, of, of CoreOS. I remember we, we named them one day in a, in a Slack conversation. And, you know, operators are there to basically do the complex operations that, you know, you don't want to deal with over and over and over again. And, you know, the pure, like, simple deployment of Cockroach, while it's pretty straightforward, you don't really need an operator, you know, it's helpful. And so, you know, and, and we know that people are relying on these things because they don't have all the expertise around the, the ins and outs of what Kubernetes is and managing stateful sets and reattaching storage and managing a, a you know, a rolling upgrade or going through some sort of, uh, you know, uh, storage of secrets and certificates as you access the database. So, yeah, we provide one that provides kind of, a, a, you know, the, kind of the day two operations that you would need around managing the database, and that's available today, so. Understood. Thanks, Jim. Charles, we're circling back to you. Uh, the question is, how does running latency-sensitive OLTP workloads on a distributed database compare to running a traditional large-scale HA database such as Oracle Rack? For example, presumably, if guaranteed transactions are written synchronously, mm -hmm. latency will always be a factor. Oof, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Um, so basically, I'm, I'm the, it sounds like you're wondering, you know, can you get away from latency if you're not using a high availability database? Um, there is always a possibility of latency when you distribute. Um, there's always, you know, people say that, oh, there, there is no lag. It's like, mm, kind of. Um, the way, that's why you want to make sure things are recoverable. So that you can get yourself back into sync. You can have very low latency, um, but I don't think it ever really will go away. That's what, from what we've seen. Understood. And, and Jim, if you'd like to weigh in on this question as well. Can you just uh, restate it? I, I just, I, I was listening to the answer. No worries. Uh, how does running latency-sensitive OLTP workloads on a distributed database compare to running a traditional large-scale HA database such as Oracle Rack? For example, presumably, if guaranteed transactions are written synchronously, yeah. latency will always be a factor. Yeah, and, you know, it just really depends on the database that you're deploying. You know, I mean, if it's kind of a traditional database where you're doing this kind of two-phase commit or you're doing asynchronous kind of, uh, you know, writes to two different instances of a database, well, you're going to have some sort of lag, even if you automate that. And there's going to be some pretty heavy, significant um, kind of deployment complications um, around that. You know, I, you know, I think look to the distributed databases, and there's, there's a couple of them out there. I mean, it's not just Cockroach that's doing this. I, Sounds like, I hate this, it sounds a little like commercial, but that's the exact problem we were trying to solve. Like, you no longer have to pay and configure Rack and Golden Gate and all this craziness when you're going across regions. It's like, just get rid of that. Um, let the database deal with it. You know, some databases, the distributed databases will implement um, 
you know, quorum rights where you are actually, you know, and they're using Raft to do so. And if people aren't familiar with Raft, um, check out this website called the Secret Lives of Data.com. Uh, it goes through a really nice, beautiful explanation of Raft. And, and we're basically doing quorum rights, you know. You, as long as I can write, you know, this data to two of the three replicas, I can commit that. Uh, and you we're able to do it with serializable isolation at scale across, you know, broad, huge, massive, you know, hops. Uh, doing that is, is kind of the trick of you know, really kind of the, the software engineering side of, of Cockroach. I mean, I would check out what we're doing. It's, and, and look at all this is in our documentation. There's a life of a transaction in our documentation. We'll explain exactly how we do it in a distributed system. And by the way, our code base is there if you want to check it out. It's completely open source. Got it. Thanks, Jim. Rajiv, we're circling over to you. Will Portworth's data services be generally available? Yes, it will be. The timing is undetermined yet. Uh, we just announced an early access program last week, and uh, certainly stay tuned, uh, you know, for more news around general availability. Uh, we've received huge interest. We certainly want to go broad with it, and, and uh, we're certainly looking for customers to, you know, sort of co-innovate with us. So. Uh, Stay tuned on uh, our general availability plans around uh, Portworth's data services. Got it. Okay, Charles, uh, another question that I'm going to throw your way. There are many questions for best practices on the deployment of databases in Kubernetes for performance, but above all for availability. There is even resistance from many database vendors like Oracle who are just getting into this containerization model. What is your opinion? <laughs> I personally and uh, professionally think that there is always a use case for something. Um, is it the best one for you? That's what you have to decide. Um, we have put things, like I said, like MongoDB, Oracle, MySQL, Postgres into containers, and you've heard about other solutions as well, like Cockroach. It's all good. You just need to go into it with your eyes wide open, and a lot of them poo-poo it because they're looking at their revenue. They, um, with Oracle, you're going to have problems with cost because are they going to because they they do that by core pricing. So are you going to now have to pay for each container, even if you have multiple pods de deployed on one host? Um, so there's questions you need to ask about that kind of thing, and then that's why people tend to go more open source for those kind of solutions. And so I Got think it. It, it, eventually they're going to have to have their own image and deploy it. It's going to be needed. They'll get there. Understood. We'll have to stay tuned on that one. Jim, next question for you. Uh, why would I use Cockroach if I don't have a global application or more requirements like large scale? Um, just simplicity and ease, honestly. Like, why mess around with trying to get some sort of legacy database to fit into this distributed environment. Use a distributed database with this distributed orchestration layer called Kubernetes. I mean, it really is simple as that. I mean, it's just something that was simply built with the same core principles and the same kind of uh, cadence as, as something like 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 a Kubernetes and, you know, manage it with pods. And you're going to automate scale. You're going to automate resilience. And you may not need that globally. But I tell you what, you're going to need it in a single AZ as well or within a single cluster. Do you want to survive the failure of your database pod? Are you doing asynchronous replication between two instances of MySQL and two pods? Forget it. Just do just deploy Cockroach in two different you know pods, and you get that. Uh, you don't have to deal with any of these kind of this operational overhead of scale and resilience goes completely away. Yet you still get normal SQL. I mean, it sounds like the best of all worlds, and uh, you know it is. It, it kind of is a little bit in, in many ways. So, um, so softball all the question. Stephen, but I like it. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Okay, so we're almost at the top of the hour. At this point in time, I'd, I'd like to ask a question of all of you. If there was one thing you would really like our viewers today to walk away, keeping in mind, what would that be? And uh, Rajiv, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, Certainly think about, you know, simplifying your developer's experience and uh, how do you, you know, bring more efficiency to your developer organization is, is what is going to drive more innovation. 
And, you know, things that you don't want is that your developer teams are actually ending up doing operations or, you know, struggling to access infrastructure. You know, literally, um, the one thing to remember is, you know, provide uh, modern data services to your developers so, so they can go, go change the world for your company. Understood. And uh, Charles, your final remarks for Anybody walks away from here knowing not to play buzzword bingo, but to do the research and find out what the best solution is for you. Is Kubernetes the right choice for you? Which database is the right for you? How, how you architect it is really important. And take the time to plan that instead of just going, oh, I heard this is cool. Understood. And wise words. Okay, so last but not least, Jim, your uh, final thoughts for today. I, you know, I'm just going to amen to the last bit of advice. You know, don't use the wrong tool for the right job or whatever that is. I, do your research and make sure that you're using Kubernetes for what you need it for because you might not. Um, it, it does get complex. It is kind of complex, um, and it might be difficult for you. So, you know, just I, I, I always think about the right tool for the right job, and, and I think that's, you know, that is just sound advice. Do your research. Okay, well, I'd like to give a huge thank you to our speakers today for coming on board and sharing their insights and expertise with us. Once again, Jim Walker, VP of Product Marketing at Cockroach Labs, Charles King, MongoDB Practice Lead at DataVail, and Rajiv Thakkar, Director of Product Marketing at Portworks by Pure Storage. If you would like to review this presentation or send it to a colleague, you can use the same exact URL that you used today. It will be archived, and we will send you an email once that archive is posted. Plus, if you would like a copy of the presentation, you can download a PDF from the Handouts tab on the console. Again, just for participating in today's event, you could win a $100 Amazon gift card. The winner will be announced on October 29th. We'll reach out to you via email if you are the lucky viewer. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon.